welcome to worship at Ocean View Presbyterian Church, where I am Pastor Terry Doherty, and we are glad you are here. So many of you here, and particularly good, Elsie, to see you here. I hope you got a ride. <laughs> She's not telling me. It's good to see you back. And lovely to have those of you who are with us online. Thank you for being with us throughout the service. There are opportunities for you to comment and also at prayer time, if you would like to send prayers or have prayers read, please tell us. And please note that my contact information, both at church and my personal cell number, are available there if you would like to reach out for any other contact. And thank you for that. Uh, I don't have announcements, but I believe a certain person does. Those props are not because, as Tom Waits would say, the piano has been drinking. And that is, if I remember correctly, Thursday the 25th? Right. And the same one is right over there. Where to call? Not to church. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, don't try to make appointments through Diane. Make appointments through Aging in Place. Are there any other announcements that we need to know about? Seeing none, will you please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship? Come. The banquet of hope and praise is ready. We come on your invitation, seeking to be fed. Feed on the love of God in Jesus Christ. We come on your invitation, be healed. Be healed by God's gracious mercy. We come on your invitation, longing for forgiveness. Love, healing, and forgiveness are here. Praise be to God. Please remain standing for hymn number 503.
Let us pray together. Hospitable God, in the midst of all we are facing, our labor, our responsibilities, our hustle, we hear the invitation, come to the feast. In the midst of all we are facing, our burdens, our shadows, our shame, we hear the invitation, come to the feast. In the midst of all we are facing, our longing, our suffering, our distractions, we hear that invitation, come to the feast. We listen, listen, grace is calling. We come for the feast awaits, amen. God of grace, you invite us to a banquet and we don't even respond. You set us a place at the table, but we find excuses not to come. You lovingly prepare for our arrival, yet we ignore your efforts. Let us confess together our sins before God and our neighbor. God of creation, you give us a world capable of abundance, but we act as if it is a world of scarcity. You give us the resources and the intelligence to provide for all, yet we lack the will and the vision to feed all your children. Forgive us, God, for filling our plates while others go hungry. God of love, you call us to be the body of Christ in the world, but we hoard the blessings of communion for ourselves. Instead of loving our neighbors, we are consumed by the love of self. Instead of loving you, we bow before idols of our own making. Forgive us, God. God of hope, we avert our eyes when we see hunger or need. We close our ears to the cries of the poor and oppressed. We refuse to let our minds be open to the realities of the world. We refuse to let our hearts overflow with love and compassion. Jesus Christ has stood alone before God, pleading for our salvation. In the mercy of... And now through a opportunity of luck, I guess, I chance today to be both a little bit and reading. <laughs> so you're gonna get more of me than you probably wish. I'm, can you, is it on now? When I started, it wasn't. Okay. Let us pray, to get, pray to the prayer of illumination. We need to find God, and God cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, grass, grows in silence. See the stars, the moon, and the sun how they move in silence. We need silence to be able to touch souls. Holy God, silence all in us that is not of you by the power of your spirit that we may truly hear and in hearing be moved and in being moved be changed by your holy word, amen. The Old Testament reading for today is Isaiah from chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. 
As I started preparing last night and started reading this, I thought, what is this? There are these and thous and thys in this. So hopefully we will get through it. O oh Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. For thou hast made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify thee. Cities of ruthless nations will fear thee. For thou hast been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the blast of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. Thou dost subdue the noise of the aliens as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lees well refined. And he will destroy on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And the psalm reading for today is from Psalm 106, verses 1 to 6, and then skipping to verses 19 and 23. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty doings of the Lord or show forth all God's praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when thou showest favor to thy people. Help me when they deliverest them, that I may see the prosperity of thy chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thy heritage. Before we and our fathers have sinned, we have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. They made a calf in Horeb and worshiped a molten image. They exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. They forgot God, their savior, who had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore, God said he would destroy them had not Moses, the chosen one, stood in the breach before God to turn away God's wrath from destroying them.
Thank you, Bev, for taking on so many roles today, more than I have myself. Our gospel lesson today, con um, not concluding, continuing our series on the patent parables as found in Matthew is from the 22nd chapter of Matthew, the first through the 14th verse. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, Behold, I have made ready my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves are killed, and everything is ready. Come, come now to the marriage feast. But they made light of it and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the thoroughfares, the crossroads, and invite to the marriage feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The word of the Lord. And gracious God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, I've talked this last month about how very human the content and the portent, if you will, of these and all of Jesus' parables are. The same is true today though it can be hard to see in the history of interpretation because this parable has been allegorized to a fair the well by the early church, by the middle church, by the 19th century church. So has the master, and this is a point where I want to say again, as I've said a couple of times already, and I'll need to say a couple of times more, masters are not always God. Sometimes they participate in qualities of God. Sometimes they are God and not God or partly God at all in the same parable, but not all at the same time. And we shouldn't let that idea that masters are God poison what we hear and keep us from imagining along with Jesus. Parables are stories and they invite our imagination, not our rational solutions. They're not puzzles, parables. Many interpreters believe that there are layers of Jesus and layers of Matthew in not just this parable, but several of the Matthewian parables, including this one, and that that makes this story confusing, especially the addition of the last part about the person who doesn't have a wedding robe, which is not in any other of the synoptic gospels. What I think is the most important takeaway from this parable is simple. Those suddenly called by God, which may very well be you and I, in whatever way, well, they might not realize that they have stood at the brink of a, dis of a decision that is, in fact, the crossroads of their life. Happens all the time. Thanks be to God, God gives more chances than one. But let me say something also for a moment, friends, and I'm going to be briefer than my cards are because I think it's important. <laughs> I could go on. In this parable, as I was going through interpretation, and in quite a number of the parables as I was going through interpretation, I found Christian anti-Semitism. 
actually quite a lot. Christian anti-Semitism, also known sometimes as supersessionism, the idea that Christianity has replaced the Judaic religion, that the Hebrew people are rejected, that classical Israel is rejected, and that we are now Israel. That is, let's just put it bluntly, entirely incorrect. And the history of Christian anti-Semitism is a sad and a cruel and a sorry one for which the church must repent and apologize and reform its own self. We especially are the reformed church always reforming. We need not to interpret in this way. God is not a cruel tyrant. Jews are not bad people. Jews have never rejected God. And in point of fact, the teaching of your Old Testament and the teaching of your New Testament are so entirely consistent with one another that they deserve not to be pulled apart and therefore were not. Jesus and the Old Testament both offer us practices, ways of being conscious of God's presence day by day and in all the things we do, and that's one of the things lifted up in this and so many of Jesus' parables, not to be concerned with the things of the world and forget the things of God. Enough on anti-Semitism. Let me find where that leaves me off. God wills to include everyone. The rejection of persons or peoples has a different basis than that sort of interpretation. And we need to be honest uh, to ourselves and to everybody else. We all live under this shroud. I think it was called something else in our translation today, but it is the shroud all people live under. That shroud is sin. That shroud is the unconsciousness of God's will in the world. God doesn't reject people, but saves people, and we are all meant to live on God's holy mountain at the end of time in peace with all other people and with all of nature. If anyone, I think, is being called out here I would agree with many of the interpreters that it is the wealthy. At the minimum, it is those who are deeply satisfied with their lives and therefore fully involved in their lives and so involved in their lives that they can, in fact, ignore what God calls. Because this is a call upon people to come to that holy mountain in advance, just like Jesus' life and death is a call to come to that holy mountain in advance live in it even as the way of the world is changed and restored by God. We as a nation are not immune to this. We as a nation have consistently failed to treat all people in the same way and to value all people. Women and minorities, even in this moment in our national life, are being minimized, their rights being taken, and that just goes to show we should not think we're somehow better than any other historic people because we are not. God shares power, and God especially shares power towards the weak who need it more in light of their suffering at the hands of the powerful. So the refusers in this parable all have one thing in common. They are focused on their life inside of this life. They're not focused on anything larger than this life or anything different from this life. That is to say, they're paying zero attention to the promises of God, that this life isn't the way it is and will not remain the way it is. Instead, they're satisfied, and so their longing, their desire, especially for God and God's ways, which we are meant to feel at all times, again, Jesus and the Hebrew Bible agree, and have ways for us to remember that we are to feel a longing for God at all times, their longing is kaput. They don't feel it. Their lives have therefore become warped. But those with eyes to see and ears to hear, or those encouraged to finally open their eyes and ears, because they long for something better, and because their desires and their loves feel blunted, their ability to move toward God cut off by the demands of those people involved with this world, they 
are the ones who gladly come. From, and a better translation I threw it in, in that passage is the crossroads. And if we fly on back to our Hebrew Bible, to the seventh chapter of Proverbs, we know that at the crossroads is where wisdom stands, saying, come this way, not that. Female wisdom, by the way. Hooray. These refusers, the ones who say, oh, I'm far too busy doing me things to hear about these God things, these refusers are, in Mosaic terms, choosing death. If you remember in Deuteronomy when Moses says, I urge you to choose life, not death. They're choosing death moment by moment in their lives. They see this world as being and that is not the last word. They don't see this world as a gift in which to settle. And Doc and a couple of other people Jim pointed out to me over the course of the botanical gardens. And yesterday, guess what? There's a place to celebrate God and be silent before the glory of God. As Klein Snodgrass, who I used very much when we had a series on parables and cases, I lean on him. As he writes, who take election, you know, the election of Israel also. All who take election for granted and are concerned about mundane affairs than the kingdom are confronted by this parable. That is what Jesus is actually doing. Friends, we don't always know it, but we in America, we're already wealthy. We're already privileged. We're already comfortable Christians. This can be and often is true on any given day. We just don't know it. And we get involved in our own affairs, and we forget how much God has given us. I believe myself that there are par parallels in this story. I don't know if they're deliberate. I think there are parallels to the story of Noah. Because Noah, if you remember, was a comfortable enough farmer with a large family and plenty of livestock who accepted the invitation from God because God made it to do something mysterious and strange, and even more than that. And by his neighbors, he was mocked. But at the end of it all, he survived. The violent and the self-willed and the ones with other priorities there at the time of the flood, they did not survive. Remember now that Matthew is writing 40 years after Jesus' time and Jesus' telling of these stories. Oral history is really good. These are accurate stories. But the pressure of, and you see this in the writings of Paul, especially our earliest Christian writings, the pressure of Jesus' immediate return has faded because it hasn't happened. That's only because we don't understand Jesus' return, but that's another sermon that's too long for today. But it hasn't happened. But the catastrophe of the destruction of the temple did just happen pretty darn recently. And so there's pressure to understand what did that mean? What was the message? And the message too often is, well, God destroyed the temple. And that's part of Christian supersessionism too. Well, God destroyed the temple because they had no idea how to worship God. No, not true. The Romans destroyed the temple, and it was a catastrophe in the daily life of Hebrews, of whom Jesus and all his disciples at this time are still members. And the understanding of what to do next was highly complicated, and they both solved it a different way. Very similar ways, actually. But this time, in the story that Matthew is telling, while we live under the rainbow covenant of Noah that God will not destroy the world, instead, God, in Jesus, reaffirms and restores the world. And those who agree to life, real life and original human life, life that centers blessing, life that is on the terms of Eden, we, 
as long as we're doing that, are the ones who are becoming the elect. God knows all about it, but we don't. We are becoming elect by making God-centered choices all the time. It's how we arrive at the feast. The ones who refuse, the ones who remain violent and abusive and selfish and obsessed with power, God allows, with a lot of regret, God allows their rejection because God values our ability to choose. Their actions reveal who their true chosen selves are. They had and they have on a daily basis, right until the day they die, they have a choice. So now talking about God, if we choose here to see the king as standing in for God, maybe in just one part of the parable, because that happens all the time. These are visual stories, not factual stories. If we say that, then we have to remember that God invited, again, in our translation, it had, I think, the bad and the good. It's really the evil and the good. I want to remind you that a week or two ago, we talked about merism. Night and day includes everything amongst those extremes. The bad and the good includes every body among those extremes. So the king invited everybody, regardless of whom they were. In the 64th chapter of Isaiah, we learn that all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. They don't impress God. They're not the basis on which anybody was invited. We know that because three chapters before in that same book, we learned that God clothes us with the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness. In case we're curious what the heck this robe is in this story, a really good probability is that this person with no robe hadn't thought about it hadn't realized what a splendid invitation, hadn't realized how privileged, even if they were pulled out of the street, hadn't thought, oh, this is a God thing. They just thought, oh, I'll, I'll slip in and get myself a nice meal. They didn't take it seriously, and that's what the king, if we choose to see the king as God, noticed. There's no commitment going on here. There's no change going on here. There's no anything going on here you're choosing against. Out you go. And so we have to ask ourselves daily a pretty simple question. Are we okay? Are we okay with God? Or are we like the guy with the rope? Or the guys who say no? Ah, not right now. There's plenty of time. Or even worse, I don't care, big deal, what's that about? So I found something that I really, really liked that I actually brought in because I noted some points. And I should tell you who this is. It's a blog called Interrupting the Silence and it hasn't got a person who is the author listed, so I can't tell you, but that's where it's from. What about the guy who showed up without a wedding robe? This is about more than a just a dress code violation. Something else was missing. He was speechless. It was as if he wasn't really there. Jesus is reminding us that there are times when we show up, but we're not really present. Our body is there, but we've left the room. So here's what I wonder. What if this man had said something, anything, what if he had just made his presence known not so much to the king, but to himself? What if he had said, I was hungry. I smelled the food. I trusted you would feed me. I was lonely. I saw the lights on. I trusted you to take me in. I was thirsty. I knew that there would be wine. I trusted you to give me a drink. I was naked. I knew people would be well-dressed. I trusted you to clothe me. 
I was sad and grieving. I heard music and laughter. I trusted you to share your joy. I was empty. I saw abundance. I trusted you to fill me. I was dying. I saw the door was open. I trusted you to give me life. What if he had said any one of those or a thousand other things like them? It would have been enough. He would have shown up with all that he was and all that he had. He would have been present. Then the king would have said to him, Oh, my dear friend, I'm so glad you got my invitation. I'm so glad you are here. You are worthy. Thanks be to God. Will you please, as you are able, stand and join me in our affirmation of faith. This is that same one we've been reading from Bruce Prewer, and we are reading it by permission because I am using this series from Reformed Magazine. The life, death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of Christ in the faces of persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on the inhumanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences of the church's own complicity in injustice. In the power of the risen Christ and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of human life in society and of God's victory over all wrong. The church follows this pattern in the form of its life and in the method of its action. So to live and serve is to confess Christ as Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And we will come to our time of prayer. And before we do that, I'm remembering something that Bob Wolf said to me. The um, the Christian Ed TED Talk is deferred to next week from this week, if you were planning on attending, and if it showed up in the bulletin next week, not this week. And thank you for that, and I'm sorry I forgot to mention it earlier. I have a prayer from Charlie O'Neill that I will share, and that is this, that a very dear friend, Oliver Gordon, has died, and that is on account of cancer. And he asks your prayers for his family and for all those who loved Oliver. Is there anything more you want to say, Charlie? Or? So perhaps most especially, hold Charlie in your prayers in the loss of his dear friend. And I know also that Gloria has a prayer that she would like to offer. Um, we had been asking for prayers for Randy's nephew, Jimmy Moot. He has been through two surgeries now um, on his um, multiple vertebrae in his back and uh, had the cage thing around him. He's in quite a bit of pain, but the hospital, in their infinite wisdom, has sent him home. So uh, <laughs> we are hoping for um, some caregivers and nurses to show up there. But your continued prayers are a real comfort to his wife and himself. Others. There's uh, Ellen on your way, and then a Bob Turner, and then a Susie. Uh, we have two joys in our family. Uh, last week, my uh, son Eric and his wife Nadia bought a, a, a very nice home in New Jersey, and my daughter Emily and her boyfriend Matt 
Matthew became engaged yesterday. Yesterday. Oh. That is lovely news. Continuing prayers for our friend Robert Miller in California. He did have surgery this week. And the latest we heard, was he tolerated surgery very well. And they're just hoping everything's going to go well. Please continue to pray for Bob. Absolutely. And, and Don Susie had her hand up. And while Don is walking up, I will remind us all that Bruce Hobler had successful knee surgery, knee replacement surgery. Um, he is doing well. Apparently had a little bit of a bleeding issue yesterday, but well and easily solved. He's already in PT, walking around, doing well. Please hold him in prayer and also Liz as her vision seems to continue to very slowly recover from her surgery. <laughs> Over the summer, we've been, I've asked you for prayers for my friend Judy Maurer who lives in Georgia. Um, the first prayer was that her daughter-in-law who had breast cancer was treated and would recover. She did not. She passed away. Oh. Um, the prayer that I have now is that her second daughter-in-law has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer and they have given her about six months to live. So please be with Becky and her family and also with Judy and Dan who were very dear to Gary and I. What a burden. Please hold Judy in prayer and her family. Um, were, were, were you guys holding hands up in the air? Elaine and Kathy? Oh. I just want to say hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> it's a joy to be back, and I want to thank everybody because I know that everybody was praying because I had little pain, I had terrible care, and here I am. We're grateful for the prayers of this community and want you to know we're moving Nathan into his house this afternoon. Yay! Prayers, please, for my daughter-in-law, Kathy. We have been praying for her all the year. Uh, this Thursday, she's going to the University of Maryland in Baltimore to have of reversal of the colostomy she's had since September. So prayers that uh, it is successful and she can heal well. Absolutely, another long road. Yeah. Appreciate all your prayers. Is there anybody else? <laughs> it's the Don Bailey annual track meet. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, just raise our prayers for the healing of Salman Rushdie from the terrible incident that happened um, this week. And what I thought quite paradoxically was the next day, the violent repression of the democracy demonstrations in Afghanistan. So just pray your prayers kind of all around the world. Thank you, Jim. Yes. And as somebody noted, if you want to know what all the fuss is about Salman Rushdie, just read him. Let us turn to God in prayer. I'm sorry, that fooled me for a second. And Bev, I thought you were going to pray in another role. <laughs> I'm going to start off with a prayer by the same person who wrote our gathering prayer. Her name is Lisa Ann Moss de Grania. And you may have thought when we started off that this was a communion service, which it is not, but it is about the feast before God. In the midst of all you are facing, your labor, your responsibilities, your hustle, Hear the invitation, come to the feast. In the midst of all you are facing, your burdens, your shadows, your shame, hear the invitation, come to the feast. In the midst of all you are facing, your longing, your suffering, your distractions, hear the invitation, come to the feast. Come eat and drink, come dress up and dance, 
Come rejoice in the king's delight, your presence, your yes, to sacred lifelong union. Listen, listen, grace is calling. Come, the feast awaits. Gracious God, we thank you for your gracious invitation, for your gracious love, for your gracious tolerance, for your gracious encouragement, for your gracious teaching, for your gracious offering of the prophets, for, at the long last and the end of it, the gracious offer of your own Son to heal us, to wake us up, to turn us toward you, to remind us who and what we are, how much more we are than we so often think. Help us to think of ourselves as more. Help us to think of ourselves as more, not just for ourselves, but more for the sake of others. Help us to think of ourselves as more, not just for our own sakes, but for your own dear sake. For this is love, and love gives and returns and shares at all times, in all places. Help us to be responsible stewards of your physical world and our social world. Help us to be responsible friends, responsible enemies, responsible human beings. Help us, in fact, to be, through the grace of your loving Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us his more perfect prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, let this congregation be a witness to you, immersed in scripture, constant in prayer, joyful in worship, generous in giving, a loving, supportive community reaching out to those in need. I will call for the offer. We are the receivers, receivers of your love, receivers of your grace, receivers of your Jesus. And so we have become givers, following your call, following Jesus, following our hearts, 
So, Lord, we give these offerings for the work of your kingdom with humble thanks for the mercies we have received. Amen. And please remain standing for hymn number 299. Go now, rejoicing always in the Lord. Stand firm in Christ and be of one mind in him. Always act with justice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone and yield up your worries on the altar of prayer. We go in peace to love, love and serve, serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Beth. And now, friends. I entrust you to God and to the message of God's grace, a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance with all who are sanctified. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and every day. <laughs>